Hello everyone. Bill Rutenberg over at the Rutenberg Library did a history tag uh, last week, I think, and he suggested that I uh, take it up. As I'm a historian, I felt that this would sort of be something of interest to me, and I really liked what Bill did with his video. So I'm going to do the history trail tag, but I'm going to start not with the first question, but with the fourth question. Um, and hopefully um, you'll see that I have to do this out of order in order for it to make sense. So question number four, close to home. What is a historical read set in your home country? Now, there's a couple of different ways for us to think about country. We could think of a political boundary or a geographic place, but I'm going to describe a cultural country, um, a country of the mind and of the body and of social interactions. Um, and in particular, this cultural country that's my home is of a religious nature. To describe this cultural country, uh, I want to use this book, The World in Flames, a black boyhood in a white supremacist doomsday cult by Gerald Walker. Um, you might be wondering how this book is part of my home country, but uh, I'll try to uh, explain that in a few moments. Uh, Gerald Walker does a lovely job in this um, memoir of describing a religious country, a religious country that colonized him. Um, this country or this church, what most people would describe as a cult, uh, is called the Worldwide Church of God. And Gerald Walker and his family, uh, several brothers and sisters, and his mother and a father were um, a part of this, uh, this, this cult, this country, in uh, late 1960s, early 1970s in Chicago, Illinois. The Worldwide Church of God uh, was founded by a man named Herbert W. Armstrong, who created this um, organization that had all these local church areas spread throughout the United States, um, in Chicago, in um, Atlanta, in California, and from here to there. And um, Gerald Walker's family was a member of this of this of this group in Chicago. Um, Walker's mother and father were both blind. And one reason that they joined this country is because they believed that if they were just good enough citizens, um, they, could, they could miraculously um, heal their disability and they could get their, their eyesight back. Now, to make sense of that, Walker describes this country of the Worldwide Church of God in great detail. Um, it had very strict rules to follow. Uh, no one was allowed to celebrate birthdays. Um, no one was allowed to celebrate Christmas. Um, if you married a divorcee, that is to say that you got married to someone who had previously been married but got a divorce, that marriage was deemed illegitimate and so you were required to then um, break this marriage that you had. You had to to end it. End it. Um, um, and I, you know, people did that. Um, you also had to uh, pay tithes. Um, they, you had to pay three tithes. So the first tithe, a tithe is ten percent. So on your gross income, uh, you had to pay. 10% of your income directly to the Worldwide Church of God. Um, you also had to pay a second tithe, so that's a second 10%, that you were allowed to keep this money and you could use it, but only for church functions. If you went to a festival or if you were doing something with the church, you could, in essence, um, use that money for you and your family to do that. But you couldn't invest it, and you couldn't spend it on rent or food or um, anything like that. Uh, 
And then every seventh year, you had to pay a third tithe. So this is a third 10% on your gross. And this money also was sent directly to the Herbert Armstrong. Um, and that money was supposed to be used by him and the Worldwide Church of God to help um, more unfortunate people than the walkers, for example, um, widows or orphans or that's who they said that they were helping with it. So there were some years where the Walker family would have had to pay 30% of their gross income that um, that their that Jer Gerald Walker's parents made um, to religious to this religious country. That's a pretty high tax rate. <laughs> considering that they also had to pay taxes to the U.S. government at the time. So um, Gerald Walker describes this country that he's in um, in incredible detail. And, of course, they're all terrified that if they mess up once, they'll be kicked out, um, cast out of the country, and they will have no hope of salvation. And, of course, his parents will have no help, hope of, of being healed. Um, in particular... All of this revolves around the doomsday notion in this um, country. And what Herbert Armstrong argued erroneously is that um, Christ's second coming would eventually come and usher in this incredible moment of chaos and war, Armageddon, a tribulation uh, that the most loyal people to God and to the Royal Church of God would be able to escape. Um, by the way, this there's a lot of history of this in American history. There's lots of people who predict Christ's return on a specific date. Um, Herbert Armstrong is just um, one of many, but he predicted that this would happen in 1972, 1975 at the latest. Uh, and so what Gerald Walker's family, his parents, believed is that they would be able to, um, if they paid enough tithes and if they, they did all their stuff, um, they didn't go to any birthdays, if they went to church on Saturday and they followed the, um, the ideas of, of, of a 24-hour rest period from Sunday fri uh, sunset Friday night to sunset Saturday night in which they were forbidden to do any kind of work or leisure they couldn't play sports or watch television um, they simply had to go to church and then they could eat a meal and socialize with other people in the the church but they couldn't do anything else on this saturday this day of rest um, if they could just do that well then they could they could escape the tribulation the way that they would escape and this is an actual plan that they had in place is that herbert armstrong would would the, the knowledge of when to leave would be revealed to him, and he would give the word the, to go. And everybody would get on these jumbo jets that would um, be purchased with tithe money, and they would, there'd be um, tens of thousands. I think there's like 120, 150,000 people who are a member of this country um, during its heyday. And they would go to um, an ancient Nabataean city, in the in this um, this the middle of the desert in the Middle East uh, called Petra, so um, today Petra is in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, um, and it was this ancient city of trade that connected ancient Egypt to Mesopotamia. Um, today it's a tourist place, and it's this hidden sort of city amongst these rocks and the mountains surrounded by a desert it's a fantastic and beautiful place i was able to go there once for a day um, but the worldwide church of god where some are going to fly these uh, jumbo jets to the middle of this desert and they're going to hide in this place that have has no electricity no running water no sewage systems no nothing for three to four years while uh, the tribulation took place and then when the tribulation was over and uh, Jesus defeated all the enemies, you would have this um, period of peace and prosperity and, and people would be healed. Um, a very far-fetched plan, but, but 
the Walker family um, believed it. And so um, he describes this, how this, co this country colonized him. Um, Ger Gerald Walker uh, describes how he felt a part of this country, um, even though he was this uh, black teenager in 1970 Chicago, he didn't really associate with African American culture. He associated with ancient Israel, and he thought of himself as an Israelite, and how he was connected to this, this, this country that the Worldwide Church of God and this culture that the Worldwide Church of God was was creating. And, and he talks about how when 1972 came and went, and 1975 came and went, and nothing really happened. He began to become skeptical and then critical. And then he was able to decolonize his mind from this cultural country um, and leave. Um, and it's, it's a powerful story. I really uh, thought the way that he did it is fantastic. Um, the reason I chose this book for this question is because the country of Gerald Walker is also the country that I was born into myself. My parents and most of my family and uh, myself were part of this country. I was born into it and I had to do all of these things too as a young person. I was, like Gerald Walker, colonized by this country in profound ways. And like Gerald Walker, I went through my own process of decolonization, skepticism, criticism, and then full-on liberation from this country. But unlike Gerald Walker, his, his country was slightly different in that the Worldwide Church of God had policies and theologies and publications that were profoundly racist. Um, they advocated segregation, they uh, advocated um, a, a, a racism, um, and at times they advocated anti-Semitism as well. Um, and Walker, I think, was very keen on this earlier in his life through his decolonization process, whereas um, for myself or people like me, I prob we probably weren't as sensitive to this at the time because in our community, we are fairly homogenous in rural Michigan and um, didn't critique this, this colonial power the way that we should have. Um, and and uh, now I can because uh, l going through this process, I no longer belong to that country. Um, but um, this book spoke to me because Walker did such um, a powerful job of showing how this country had colonized all of us and colonized some people in more profound ways than others and how we can work through our own decolonization of the cultural boundaries that define us. So with that being said, hopefully the rest of this tag will make a little more sense. Um, the second question is that I'm going to answer is actually the first question of the tag, um, which is first steps. Uh, what book, movie, or person uh, introduced you to history? And this is a pretty easy question for me to answer because the person who introduced me to history was probably my mom. And um, even at age four, um, she would, uh, before I could read, she would take me to the local library in our small rural community surrounded by cornfields, but we had a public library. And um, uh, she would take me to the library, and instead of going into the kids' section, I would go to the history section. I couldn't read the books, but I could, I could look at the pictures. And the pictures in these history books just astounded me. They allowed me to imagine this world that all this stuff happened before I existed. And it just... I couldn't get my head around it all the time. It was just so fascinating to me. Um, and so I think she's the one who introduced me to history through taking me to the library. The book that introduced me to history in a sort of a strange roundabout way is probably the Bible, which is not really a history book, unless you're a member of the 
uh, Worldwide Church of God and you've been colonized by this country because they believe that this that the Bible is literal, that it is a history book, that everything mentioned in the Bible happened exactly as it's described. Um, as a historian, I would have to challenge that because for a lot of the stories in the Bible, as fantastic as they are and as, as powerful and as meaningful as they can be, there's not a lot of evidence, for example, of Noah's Ark or of the crossing of the Red Sea or... Um, where the Garden of Eden existed. Um, and so most Christians, most people who follow the Bible as a theology would see these as more metaphors and more powerful stories. <clears throat> but for me, as a young colonized youth, I saw these as historical moments, and I was fascinated by them. I would look in the news for evidence or in my own explorations as a, as a preteen, <laughs> teenager, as for evidence of this past. And although I never found it, what I think was fascinating about this moment is that it, it connected me to the past. Um, in similar ways that my mom's taking me to the library, t connected me to the past and facilitated my relationship with the past. And so as I grew older and became went through a process of decolonization, um, the, uh, lo the, the style of history um, and the use of evidence became more important. Um, and, uh, but I still maintain this relationship to the past that, that the Bible, in essence, and the understanding that we had as, as young people um, connected me with. Um, the movie that probably stimulating my interest in the past. Likewise, mixing this theology and history together uh, has to be Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Of course, the Lost Ark is in the Old Testament. It's in ancient Israel. For me, as a young person, this would have been a real artifact that only needed to be discovered um, um, and um, uh, when Indiana Jones finds it, it brought these sorts of ideas um, together. Um, of course, the ark has been lost to time. It, it, um, it's, it's never been discovered, but Indiana Jones made it real for me. Um, and so that kind of tied me to, to history as well. Um, the uh, second question um, is well-trodden path. What is your favorite historical recommendation, uh, book, place, or movie? Uh, I'll start with the movie first. The movie that I like to recommend um, at the moment is the film by Sam Mendes, 1917. I think this is a masterpiece um, uh, that um, sing almost single-handedly reinvented the genre of war films, particularly First World War films. It is about two British soldiers in the trenches of World War I who have to cross no man's land and um, in order to save um, their fellow soldiers from a, a, a German trap and a catastrophe. Um, I thought it was just brilliant. And so that's the historical film that I'd recommend. The book that I'd recommend, and there could be many, but for today I'm gonna recommend Natasha Trethewey's Native Guard. This is not a history book. Natasha Trethewey is a poet, not a historian. And her book, Native Guard, came out several years ago. It's very thin. I think it's less than 80 pages. Uh, but it's a beautiful book that, um, of poems um, that also tells a story of not only her trying to navigate her parents' divorce uh, as she's trying to navigate moving from girlhood to womanhood, but also her attempt to navigate uh, being black in the South. Um, and at the same time, while she is learning about the Civil War, thinking about the long shadows, the, the, the legacy of the Civil War itself and what it meant for <clears throat> slavery and her own 
experience that she was going through when she was younger. Um, it's just this beautiful collection of poems. Um, it's just brilliantly executed that weaves all of these ideas together in this incredible tapestry that you can read in, in an hour or an hour and a half and um, just come away with learning so much and of, um, of such beauty and power. Um, I'd recommend that book. Uh, the place that I'd recommend, I had this experience a few years ago. The place that I'd recommend to go to um, is in Memphis, Tennessee. It is the uh, Lorraine Hotel, which, of course, in 1968, in, on the balcony is where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Um, but today, the hotel is still there, and it's been turned into a museum. You can not only pay your respects to the site where Dr. King died, uh, but you can also um, learn um, through artifacts and through film and through letters and through um, all kinds of public history uh, presentations the civil rights movement and what it meant for so many people. Um, I would say it's great to do a tour, but I don't believe it's a site of tourism. I believe it's a site of pilgrimage. And so I would recommend that you go as a pilgrim um, to connect uh, to this movement in ways that are um, interactive and intimate and, and profound. Um, so question I've dealt with question number four already. So question number five, the trail not taken. What historical areas, eras do you avoid? And the answer is that as a historian, none. <laughs> I may not know as much about certain eras as I would like, but I would never avoid any of them. Um, the work of history is interconnected, I think, with lots of different people and places. And I would um, like to admit my um, naivety and ignorance about an era, but I would never run away or avoid it. I would walk, run towards it to try to learn more about that era, um, which, of course, is a lifelong process that I am committed to. Uh, and I hope you, you would consider that kind of commitment, too. Um, question number six, trail map. What historical reads are on your to-be-read list? I have three. I admit I don't own any of these books yet, but um, I desperately want to own them and read them. The first one is the Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Frederick Douglass by David Blight, um, which apparently is fantastic to read, and I, I want to read that one. The second book is written by a Hawaiian historian, and um, he it's called um, The Boundless Sea. Um, I'm from Atlanta. When I write history, you might argue that I have a geographic perspective, uh, not only cultural perspective, but a geographic perspective of the East Coast, of the South, of looking westward and always seeing the sunset, if you will. Um, in this, The Boundless Sea, um, the perspective is taken from Hawaii, as if you're writing from the center of the Hawaiian Islands, and instead of the setting sun, what you see around you is the ocean boundless, the boundless sea, and how their place um, influences the way that you write history. So this is apparently um, half history, half memoir, um, but it's one that I want to read. Then the third one is um, Denmark Vesey's Garden. Uh, this is, uh, again, I haven't read, I don't know, but I, I've read reviews on it. It's apparently a brilliant take on slavery and memory and the legacy of slavery um, and the legacy of Denmark Vesey, which of, who, of course, um, tried to initiate a slave rebellion and paid for it with his life dearly. Um, uh, but it ties all of these themes together, and um, I'd like to read that one as well. Question uh, seven, pioneers. What historical person inspires you? Uh, there, uh, I can name many people. And I hope you don't consider this a cop-out because I'm dead serious about this. I'm not um, trying to be silly, but I guess the people, the historical person that I that inspire me, um, I would I would say are the the nameless and the unknown of the past. Um, 
all these people that walk the face of the earth from prehistoric times to fairly recently. Um, you know, today, I think we're going to be the most known and the most named society in history, up till now anyway. We all are creating our archives and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. Everybody's going to know our name and everybody's going to sort of know who we were. But before that technological and even digital revolution, there's billions of people who we don't know who they were um, or what their names were. They left no record, no birth certificate, no nothing. Um, and I'm, I'm fascinated by these individuals. Um, what did they have to deal with? How did they get through life? What happens when they had successes or when they had to deal with horror of war? Um, or slavery, or holo the Holocaust even. Um, how do they do that? Uh, I think that the nameless and the unknown, s we can imagine, have a lot to say about what makes us human, um, their humanity. And in this way, I think that they're very inspiring because when they have to deal with their reality, even though they don't have the technology that um, is available to you and I, their humanity speaks through that, and that humanity is what I find not only interesting, but inspiring. Question number eight. Tag your fellow history nerds. Uh, I'm going to leave this wide open. Whoever wants to, I tag you. So if you're interested in doing this, um, feel free, um, and I'll see you next time.